And we are live. Hello, everyone. Marco Montemagno here, founder of Super Summit, and we're here for the SMEs Mobile Strategies 2014. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have here a person that I follow for the day one with, with his startup, uh, Aaron Bali, co founder of Udemy. Aaron, how are you? Pretty good. So um, everything is going well. How are you doing, Marco? <laughs> And I, I would actually say Marco, Marco has been one of our first super successful instructors. <laughs> I have been following him for a long time as well. Really, really amazing. I remember, I, I tell you exactly, I, I want to give you this story. I remember exactly the day that Udemy launched. And uh, the, I, I jumped on immediately. And the reason why I immediately thought that uh, Udemy could become a huge success was that uh, it was there, there was a huge pain among all the let's say instructors around the world or people who wanted to uh, share their knowledge, teach or sell online courses because you know we had all these little crappy scripts around uh, or WordPress plugins and uh, so it was really a big problem to to you know upload something in an easy way, sell it or or make it for free. But it, there was a, a huge uh, space. And uh, when Udemy came out, I remember I thought, wow, these guys they they did it exactly the the right way. And uh, and from that moment, I just saw you growing, 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 growing. I'm waiting for the IPO, and I I hope I will get you know a share, <laughs> at least one, for. Uh, yeah, no, great. Uh, how was this this growing? I mean, the last couple of years, I just saw big funding coming in and uh, a lot of, of users uh, joining the platform, really. Yeah, but, and the company is doing growing extremely well. So we right now have three and a, three and a half million active students, uh, roughly 15,000 courses on the site, um, and our revenues have been growing roughly four four times since last year. This time, so I think like four year, four four x a year, you could consider it as an amazing growth. Wow, amazing, really! And do you, um, you you always based in San Francisco? Um, for Udemy, yes, but the Udemy has a lot lo longer history. I was in Turkey when I first decided to create a marketplace for teaching. Right. This was I think seven or eight years ago. Um, so. We were building live education tools back then. I think it was too early for its time, but the, the tool we are using, Google Hangouts, if you consider it as a live communication tool. So we were building a tool some, somewhat, like the, somewhat like that. And we first sold it to a few organizations. We started making some money from it. Uh, but look, I and my co-founder, when we were in Turkey, we had the vision that Instead of asking for a licensing fee for a live teaching tool, if we made it for free so that anybody in the world who wants to teach something can use it to access people who want to learn the same subject, like if we, if we make it free and make it like just give it for the use of millions of instructors around the world, millions of experts around the world, the value that we, we would be creating would be significantly higher. So we had this idea. So we actually built the company in Turkey first. Okay. Um, so it was the same overall vision, just creating a place where you could learn anything you want, anytime you want. Uh, but it was a live education marketplace. People would go on camera and teach courses this way. So we built the product, but very quickly we realized that it wouldn't work. So Turkey, like 2007, was kind of wrong time, wrong place. So there wasn't enough, there wasn't a large enough audience of experts who are doing stuff online. So there were experts, but they weren't like, Internet was somewhat new for them. Uh, bandwidth bandwidth was, was extremely expensive. Even for the user side, like you couldn't actually do video streaming for a long time period, and it was slow. The experience right. wasn't that good. Um, and then we also realized that live education was hard to make, hard to work in a marketplace environment. Because in, when you build a marketplace, I'm going to talk about this uh, yep. today. So you, your first problem is what people call chicken and egg problem which means if there are not enough courses, why would students come to the site? And if there, if there are not enough students, why would instructors want to come to the site, right? Sure, sure. And when you make it live, that problem becomes significantly harder to solve because in addition to having the supply and demand in your site, you also have them, need them at the same time. So um, we decided wow. that live wasn't the right model to start, so we had to shut down the company in Turkey. 
migrated over to Silicon Valley. Um, it took us maybe three, three, three and a half years to get back back up to our feet here. Uh, but once we were ready, we decided to start it again. So we pivoted into an on-demand learning company. Uh, but uh, but it was I think the right time had come. Silicon Valley was a better place, and the on-demand was the right platform. So since we were able to fix these three issues, um, the company has been growing like ever since we launched it. Amazing, amazing, really great, great story, and I uh, I really like also the fact you know that there are people coming from all over the world uh, and, uh, and they can launch amazing companies. But Aaron, we are here today to talk about um, uh, how to build a marketplace, and obviously in into the mobile strategies uh, um, uh, theme, uh, we are focused on, on mobile. So I, I also want to hear from you some takeaways about mobile strategy and so on. By the way. Uh, Udemy launched, I don't remember exactly when. I know that I'm the number one unpaid evangelist for Udemy, but I don't remember all the exact uh, uh, dates. Okay. But uh, there was a, a specific moment in time when Udemy decided to launch uh, its uh, mobile app and uh, iPad app and all this kind of thing. So I, I remember it was really, a, a let's say, a turning point. And, uh, yeah. and you did a big job over there, so you also have a lot of data about uh, about that. I was checking, by the way, on my um, mm -hmm. Android uh, mm -hmm. your app, and and really, I, I will have tons of questions about it because it's very interesting how you do it with videos mm -hmm. and with, with with so many things to put together. So a lot of mm -hmm. valuable uh, insights here. So, Aaron, I, I would say let's go straight to your presentation. I mm -hmm. will interrupt you only if there are coming questions from the chat or there is maybe something to clarify immediately. Otherwise, I'll try to keep the, the questions for the end and uh, and we see how it goes from there. What do you think? Um, that makes sense. So yeah, all right. So, yeah, very good. So if you set up your presentation, it's uh, is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I already see it. Uh, you, you did one of the most difficult thing on Google Hangout on air. <laughs> So that, that is sharing the slides. This is one buggy feature of Hangout on there, but you did it great. All right, I'm, I see the slide. I'm, I'm fairly familiar with this problem because, as I said, the first thing we built was a live teaching tool. So we had all this PowerPoint sharing and screen sharing video issues. So I know how hard it is to make this. But, but why can you can you tell me why it's so hard? Just my curiosity. I mean, why is it so difficult to do something that is working smoothly? I mean. So people still have microphone and camera problems because each device comes with its own camera, own microphone, and they keep creating problems. And there are some privacy concerns about use of microphone. So the operating systems almost make it harder to use for applications to access your camera. And they have a good reason to do to want to do so. But practically, like just everybody will always have microphone, like audio camera issues. And then I think people, like the rest is a product problem. I think people were, most people are approaching this wrong. So our live classroom education was working significantly better for this use case. And the reason is most of the tools are made, designed as communication tools. They are designed for companies to like have meetings, not right. for like consumers to use to teach something or to share knowledge. That's why it's a little bit like not the right experience. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so, but I'm going to talk about how to start a marketplace. Uh, because when Marco asked me about what, what I want to talk, I, I just didn't want to tell you guys the story of Udemy and everything. So, like, I'm happy to tell them, but I, since I know that most people here are entrepreneurs or they want to start companies, I wanted to maybe share something which is more practically useful. So, as you guys might know, Udemy is a marketplace for online courses. Uh, experts around the world come to Udemy. They usually have an idea about something they want to teach. And they build their course completely on Udemy. We really help them throughout the process. And student, student, taught, students take those courses um, just around the world. And they can take them anytime they want. Um, so just like quick numbers, we when I made this presentation, we had 3 million users. Right now, we have 3.5. Um, 2.2 million hours of course has been completed on Udemy. That's kind of an interesting way of looking at it because if you do a physical course in a classroom, there's a cost of maintaining this. Like we probably like save people tens of millions of dollars of the cost that they would actually realize. We raised a total of $48 million so far, so that's usually a sign of the company going well. 
Uh, but I want to talk about um, marketplaces. So let's start with like, why would you want to start a marketplace? Because I tell you, like, if you have an idea and if you think that you, it could be a marketplace, it could be not a marketplace, you should probably not create a marketplace. It's, sign it's significantly harder to build it as a marketplace. So, but I want to kind of start talking about uh, why, like, I started Udemy. So um, I I grew up in I was born in Turkey in a very small village. So these are my two sisters. I'm the young the youngest person, and my primary school was was something like this. Um, uh, there was it was a small place. We didn't have there weren't enough teachers in Turkey. So they would actually sent only one teacher for our village. So and, we and, had you, and you don't teachers. seem guys very happy at school. I have to say. Sorry. Yeah, and you don't seem very happy at school. Yeah, this is actually this is not my picture. I couldn't find the picture, but I could. I found the picture of another class. But simply, we had one teacher going um, like five different grades in the same time, and she was actually teaching the first grade, and then they would give, she would give them a homework, and she skipped to the next next group of students. So simply, what I'm trying to tell here is is not a different like the resources in the world are not enough to sustain most people, right? So because of this, you have some schools where there are amazing teachers and they have the best access to everything. And then you have this majority of the places which cannot simply access those resources. So for me, my, my primary school was an example of that. Like one teacher for a whole school is a significantly under, like is significantly less than the, the supply side we need, the supply side here being the teachers. So, but something interesting happened over time. So I was really interested in mathematics back then, and I was somewhat talented at it, but there was nothing to go, no place to learn about like more complicated mathematical issues. Um, and one day my parents, which I consider as the real, uh, real visionaries here, they bought me a computer and internet access for three months. Um, so that was, this was like back in the 90s, and internet access was super expensive at our, at our hometown because it was new, it was only accessible by the richest people. So for them, it was a huge sacrifice. And they actually didn't even know what a computer was. So they didn't know what internet was. But they were seeing my frustration, the fact that I was being, like I was kind of hitting the limits of my environment very quickly. And they had heard that com I could maybe do some interesting things with computers, right? That was the only thing they know. But because of the lack of any other options, they actually did it and bought me a computer internet. And I learned something very quickly. So if you have a huge desire to learn something, and if you have access to the internet, that actually creates a magical moment. Because internet is full of resources, full of things you can do. So just like this desire, this and a driven person can learn a lot from internet. And I, using those websites, I realized, okay, like, I started teaching myself mathematics. I found IRC channels, forums, where people were discussing about mathematical problems. And it was obvious to me, like, if we create the right structure, internet could be people's primary learning destinations. So, and if you kind of merge it back to the lack of teachers, um, to me, like it felt like if we can make internet the primary learning destination, we can much better utilize the amount of resources there are in the world for learning, like in this case the teachers. So if, the, if each teacher is not limited to only teaching uh, 30 students around her um, kind of uh, around the place she lives, instead if she could teach thousands of people maybe. Um, and also, there are other people who are not even teachers, but they're amazing at like a particular subject. If you can even use their um, time to teach the world, like we could make a significant improvement in the education problem, educational access problem in the world. So that was the core idea for me. Um, and so we came up with this vision. So. We wanted to let anybody learn anything online. That was why we wanted to start Udemy. And this, this is before we decided to create a marketplace, right? This is a time where we want to do something for the world of education. And this vision sounds really good, but it's a really big vision, right? And let's kind of 
look at this vision in more detail. We want to let anybody learn anything online. Anyone in this case would be hundreds of millions of people worldwide, right? A lot of different people who have different learning styles, different things that they want to learn. They're in different locations, right? So, and you want to also teach them anything they want to learn, right? Then there are a lot of different subjects, different right. like different languages, different ways of describing those subjects. So this is like a massive, massive vision, right? Normally, like if I want to, to, to teach mathematics to people in my city, I would open a classroom and I would actually invite them and I would teach them mathematics. That would be a fairly sufficient way to do. But if you have a larger vision like this, like there's no way you can do this by teaching everything you, yourself or teaching everything with a bunch of other people that help you. That's where like you need a marketplace because like this is such a large problem. You cannot solve it like by just like, brute for, in a brute force way by just doing it, right? So here comes like the, the concept of marketplace. Marketplaces sorry, sorry, are this. Sorry to interrupt you, but ju just to understand. And you started yes. anyway from uh, the 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 side of the marketplace that want to learn. In your vision, you didn't say we want uh, all the teachers in the world teaching anything. You you started from the side of the of the users. You want. Uh, any users learning anything? Exactly. That was that was our main goal. Like we wanted to let any user want to learn any like anything online, right? And like the fact that it was a marketplace, so the teachers were able to use this was almost a, like a side effect. It was a way to fulfill this goal. And obviously, we also thought about like teachers who would want to share their knowledge, but that's only useful if there if there are people who want to learn that subject. Yeah. yeah. So the marketplace is, as I said, like we come up with the concept of marketplace. It's this interesting mix of four things. There's a technology that you are building because everybody is, you are bringing all the supply and demand to the same place. You can make things work a lot more efficiently than it used to work. So that's the first aspect. And then there's the community. There are people who want to like help you like accomplish your goal. In our case, we realized that instructors became a pretty strong community on Udemy. They all wanted to teach. They all had like similar uh, things that they want to do with their life. So they like the kind of creative lifestyle and they wanted to, they, they liked helping people. And just because of this, the instructors on Udemy never felt like competitors. They felt like a community of people who are helping each other in, in accomplishing a common goal, right? And there is this advantage of, advantage of the brand because you have so much of the supply and demand in the same place. The marketplace itself can operate as a brand that your users will trust. And obviously, there are the operational aspects. So since you are doing so many of the courses in the same environment, you can make the tools much better. You can make them like you can maybe deduct some of the costs. So there are a lot of these advantages of the of the marketplace model, um, which helps to solve these extremely hard goals. So my simple claim is marketplaces is a very shitty thing to do. It's so hard that you will hate your life, right? <laughs> Notoriously hard. Like you, like you will hate the fact that you are doing a marketplace business, but, but it is the only way to solve some extremely hard problems in the world, right? If you can solve a problem with, with purely technology, it's so much easier. But in our case, with thought letting anybody to learn anything they want to learn online could not be solved with technology. We needed technology, community, brand, and operations in the same place. That's why we like we chose to do the marketplace. All right, and there's some also kind of other like business advantages. Uh, marketplace have super strong like network effects. They have high competitive barriers. Meaning, if you start the marketplace, it's really hard for a competitor to come in and compete with you once you have the enough model and you can get millions of users on scalable business models, blah, 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 blah. So like these are all the things, advantages that investors will talk to you about. But in my perspective, like who gives a shit? Like who gives a shit about the high competitive barrier? Like I, like, I never think about competitors. So, like you only do a marketplace because you have to, right? Like all those other advantages there that just like you can leave it to do your investor decks. But in reality, like you should do it because that is the only way to do to solve this extremely hard problem. 
All right. So um, as we can kind of, kind of discuss, like how, like why would, like what you would ever think about doing. Let's kind of think about the design of a marketplace. Um, this is a usually overlooked uh, area. And when I talk, I say design. I'm not talking about visual design. I'm talking about the structure. So in a typical marketplace, you have the supply side and the demand side. For for example, in Udemy, supply side is the instructors, demand is the used students. In Airbnb, the supply side would be host and the demand would be the people who rent these um, houses. So, and between the supply and demand, you have what I call the service chain. So, typically, like you connect supply and demand in the same place, you have this common place where both of these parties come. And um, for the demand side, you usually like have a bunch of different options in the supply side, and you have to figure out like you have to help them discover the right uh, product for them, right? And there's pricing, so um, it could be fixed prices like Uber does, and it or it could be open pricing like Udemy, eBay, Airbnb. So the payments is another idea. It could be centralized, uh, like what most marketplaces are doing these days, like Udemy, eBay. Like you pay to the marketplace directly, so they handle all the payment issues. Or it could be decentralized, as it is in Craigslist. Craigslist doesn't handle all, any of the payments. Um, again, so um, typically there's the actual service, pretty much always that's the supply side handling this. Um, but then even the service is handled, there's going to be customer experience, like customer service issues. So people, if somebody has a problem with the offering, do, do they go to your supply side directly or do they come to you? In Udemy's case, for example, as Udemy, we handle, like, we make sure there's a good enough customer support. If you don't like the course you take, we actually give you like no question refund. So we are the guarantee of the service, but in other places, uh, sometimes the uh, like the risk is complete on the user, so the supply side is supposed to um, give their right customer customer support. Um, anyway, so if you think about all of this, so in each of these areas, you have the option of either marketplace does this, so you centralize it, or you just leave that operation to um, uh, to them. Um, so to your supply side. Yeah. So let's kind of start giving some examples, right? So there are two companies I think that are, that are almost like the extreme examples of this uh, structure. Craigslist is the place where everything is decentralized. The only thing that Craigslist does is bringing the supply and the demand in the same place. That's pretty much the only thing, only thing they do. And from like the service to pricing to customer support to like everything, almost everything happens is done by the supply side, right? The marketplace is really like thin. So the advantage of this is that you can do a lot of different things this way, right? Like Craigslist does cars and posts and uh, like job listings. That there, there's pretty much every type of listing that you could imagine. And on the extreme opposite end, there is this new shiny company, Uber. Um, Uber is the private car um, car service. So you just open your iPhone application, you press a button, and then a car shows up in your doors. So Uber, Uber is also a marketplace. There are drivers. So Uber doesn't have like employee drivers. So the drivers are uh, just like the supply side of the marketplace, and the people who ask for those cars is the demand side. But Uber does things in a very different way. Everything is almost centralized. So you don't actually go through the profiles of, of uh, drivers. You just click a button, so they handle the discovery themselves. They will just guarantee you that there will be a good enough driver. So if your driver is not good, they will just fire that person so that they, like you don't have to think about it. So the price is centralized, so it's fixed price. So pretty much uh, the whole process of the decision is centralized except driving you. Right? So, Again, I'm not saying that any of this is better, but this is something you have to design. And these are the two extreme examples. And if you put up, up all the companies like in between, like each company will have a different approach. So eBay was a lot closer to Craigslist, but they still centralize things like payments, right? Um, Udemy is somewhere in between, so we don't centralize pricing, so the instructors choose their own price. And those decisions are, those are critical decisions. Because in a, in a case like a driver, it's a commodity experience. You don't really care about who's driving you. You just may want to make sure that's a trustable person. 
But in Udemy, we really care about who we are learning from. So we couldn't like, like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense to centralize the discovery. So we had to like let instructors choose, let students choose who they want to learn from. And each company usually centralizes something and decentralizes other thing. Airbnb is very interesting because they, for a long time, they centralized the photography, um, although that's not centralized by most other places. Anyway, so this design is ex extremely critical, and in the early days, you will have to make these decisions, and you will have to. These decisions are going to be very important decisions about how you operate your company. Um, but on the other hand. There is a movement here. Part of it is related to mobile, which is the, which is likely the subject of this seminar. So the trend is moving from more decentralized market marketplaces to more centralized marketplaces. This is kind of an interesting um, like image. This shows you like all the categories on on Craigslist and how different startups actually were spawned from one of the subcategories. So what all of these guys do is take one of these Craigslist subcategories, which is like fairly decentralized, and put a lot of centralization into place to kind of make sure the customer support is good, discovery is much better, maybe like pricing structure is better, and they make they started massively successful companies from from the sub verticals. So and so in most year last years you are seeing more of Uber type of companies instead of create this type of company. So, and mobile is the also a major push here because when you are talking, thinking about mobile experience, people don't want to go through profiles. People don't want to spend time on making sure the person is trustable. People want to press a button and they want to, they want to think that you are going to guarantee a good enough experience. Right? The mobile has been a huge push towards more centralized, more unified, Experiences across different areas. All right, Marcos, um, let me like do a kind of sanity check with you. How is this going so far? Yeah, yeah, everything perfect, and uh, I, I will never open a marketplace in my life after you <laughs> you gave the first description because it's tough. It's really tough. But uh, obviously, if you need to solve a, a big problem, that's the only way you have to go. And uh, the designing the right way is absolutely fundamental, I guess. Yeah. So now I will kind of come to the part where, um, like, I try to explain how you would start a marketplace. So if we kind of came up with, like, talked about why it's hard and what, like, how you like design it. So when you start a marketplace, by far the most important problem that you will face early on is the chicken and egg problem. So if you don't have enough supply, why should demand come? Like, if you don't have enough courses on Udemy, why would the students come to Udemy and, and take a course? And if there are not enough students on Udemy, why would the um, instructor come to Udemy to teach something, knowing that there won't be any students who are, who's gonna take her course? So this problem is so hard, like, that like I think whether a marketplace is successful or is not or not like it's ninety percent of it relies on whether you are able to solve this problem or not. Because once you solve this problem, once you have the initial traction and enough supply and demand, everything after that point is downhill. Like your job gets easier and easier every year, right? The first two three years in Udemy was pretty hard, really challenging, uphill battle. But right now it's it's, it's been four and a half years. The rest of it is downhill. As you get more instructors, there are more students who are interested in the subjects they are teaching. And as we get more, more students, instructors are significantly more um, incentivized to teach on Udemy. And it's really hard for a competitor to crack in because we have all, we have all this uh, density already. So this is like by far the most important problem. And while solving the, like, and there are a bunch of tricks to solve this problem I'm going to share, share with you guys today. So before I look, share those, uh, look, just to set up the framework, I want to talk to you about two concepts. The first concept is, is liquidity. liquidity. Liquidity says, for each of your supply, is there enough demand? And for each of your demand, is there enough supply? So um, in the case of Udemy, if a user comes to Udemy, can we say that they will, want, they will definitely have a course that they would like to, like to take? 
right? If 99% of the users can find a course they would like to take, that's very good. But if 50% of the people can take a course, okay, that's not as good. If only 10% can find, that's like that's a problem. And the same way, like when instructor teaches a course on Udemy, are, are they able to get students, right? So this is the kind of concept of liquidity. And I'm gonna quote Simon Rothman, who's a partner at Grey Lab Ventures, very focused on uh, marketplace businesses. He had written that liquidity isn't the most important thing, it's uh, the only thing, which which couldn't be more true. So in a marketplace, that's the really only thing you should think about. Like can we get like, can we get enough can we give, give enough students to most instructors? And if you think about Kickstarter, for a long time the only metric they really cared about was uh, can most of the people who start projects get funding? And all the other decisions they were actually make, making were based on optimizing that. So in this case, you, you have to focus on, on both sides. So can instructors get enough students? And can mm -hmm. students get enough courses that they are interested in? That's true, yes. But usually in the early days, one of the part, like one of the sides will be harder to get. And so usually like pick one of them and focus on them. In our case, what we did was we had the first few instructors and we put a lot of focus into making those few instructors successful. And this was especially after we launched the paid course platform. So for the first two, three instructors, we put a lot of effort to making sure they had enough users, enough revenue, so it was worth their while. So um, that's, that's how much we cared. For st students, it was impossible to fix this initially because most of them wouldn't, like, we just had few courses, like, most of them wouldn't have a course that they would like. So instead, what we did was we were trying to get students who are automatically, uh, who are already interested in the areas that we had courses for. So that's, that's how we, like, kind of make sure the liquidity works, kind of focusing on your, your user acquisition in the areas where you have some supply. And so I will come up with a framework. This is from um, Paul Graham. So he had an article about this. But I actually didn't get this advice from Paul Graham. So we were at a breakfast party, and it was the early days of Airbnb as well. So I, I met Brian there, and I was asking everybody the same question at that point. Like We didn't have initial traction, and we, I was asking, how did you get your initial traction? And he said these things that apparently Paul had told him. He said, do all the things that don't scale. So this might not make sense for you, right? So like we yeah. are startup owners. Startups about are all about growth and getting millions of users, and pretty much everything you are trying to do is about scaling a value proposition that you created early on. But for me, like when he said these words, like I didn't need more description. It immediately triggered for me. So because marketplaces are most efficient when they are very large. A small marketplace, when you have very little supply and demand, you, you're not that useful. But the solution is, what if, like, instead of trying to be useful across the board, what if you do a lot of things manually yourself? All that doesn't scale, like all these few customers you have, you can make them relatively happy. So for our case, like, we had to just make sure a few students were super happy and a few instructors were happy, and we could do everything ourselves if, if that was the reason, the way to do it. So and a lot of the other things I will talk about what we did. The actual was coming from this idea. So we first said, okay, like if we cannot get instructors to teach, what if we teach from some of the courses ourselves first, right? Like ideas like this. And in Airbnb's case, that was the time when they they realized that the photography on Airbnb was really poor, right? And your alternative is going to a hotel which has amazing photography. Like how do you compete with that? And their advantage was that they only had a few users, so they were able to go to their ho their hosts one by one, and they were taking professional photos of their houses. And although you can say, okay, like you cannot do this for millions of users, but if when you have tens of customers, you can make them extremely successful by doing this. And I think the best example of this comes from Check.com. If you guys don't know about it, is um, Check is a very successful online book rental website. They had a very hard time early on because, like, again, if you, there are no books rented, like, why would you rent your own book? And if there are no students who are planning to rent, like, why would you put your book up there? So what they did was, every time you said, I want to rent this book, they would personally go to 
Craigslist, find that book, buy it for you with their credit card, and send it to you, right? And the same way, when a, uh, when a person wants to rent their book, they will take that book title, they will go to Craigslist, rent that book, take the money, give it to the renter. So this might feel really stupid because it is stupid, right? Like, why are you still doing a marketplace if you are doing everything yourself? But, the, but what really happens is, for these first users who came to check, that was a magical experience, right? Whatever book you are looking for, they find it for you. Whatever book you want to get rid of, they let you get rid of it. And then I, I think at one point they had enough users and renters so that they actually didn't need to go to Craigslist each time. So the marketplace got initial traction, and then after that time, check itself was had good enough uh, volume to uh, make supply and demand successful. So it's really critical. So, Aaron, uh, let, yeah. let me recap here because I, I, I love Paul Graham and I love all uh, his um, essays and I, obviously they are always very rich of, of insights. But what, what you say basically is um, try in the beginning to get the initial traction to focus on the, 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 the side of the marketplace that you decide to focus, so demand or, or supply. Uh, try to make those initial few users super happy, super enthusiast about your service. And in this way, maybe the, the snowball start to roll. And if, if when it starts to grow, you will uh, automa automatize everything. You'll, 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 you'll invest because you'll have the numbers and uh, hopefully the, the revenues to, to structure everything properly. But initially, just do it yourself and try to do it uh, at the top level, something like that. Doing yourself, to let you like ask your parents to do it, like whatever it does, like whether it scales or not doesn't doesn't matter. Like just do it and make sure that your users are happy. And the, the key thing is that the fact that you can do unscalable things is your biggest competitive advantage compared to a large competitor, right? Because let's say you're competing with Google on that. Google won't be able to do it and do anything that doesn't scale. Right, but you will be able to do it. That, like you can use this to your advantage, right? Like although it was supposed to be be, be a disadvantage, you can actually turn it into an advantage for you. And, and, and I'll actually give, yeah, and, go and ahead. Sorry, sorry, Aaron. Sorry uh, again on this point. And how can you understand if um, that thing that you do uh, is just an unscalable thing? So mm -hmm. or. or uh, at some point, it can be a scalable business. I, I give you an example. Um, if I, I don't know, if I do webcam interviews, okay, yeah. is that an unscalable business? I mean, because I can do, I don't know, ten webcam interviews in a day. It's a stupid example, but just came up in my mind like that. So um, the uh, even if I have uh, users that could be super happy watching the interviews, I can only do 10, you know? If I yeah. want to create a scalable business, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't clone myself. So uh, it's, it's impossible to to make it grow, something like that. Uh, may, maybe it's not the right example, but I, I, I'm is, sure you understand. It is the right example. It is the right example. So let me, let me explain how this would work. So your core business, what you want to start, should be scalable, right? right. So in your example, if your goal was to do like webcam interviews, like that, that's not a scalable thing, like, right? So, but let's say you wanted to like create a place where people share interviews, almost like a marketplace for interviews, which is a scalable business, right? You want, a, you will know that anybody like can like there could be a lot of people who want to do those webcam interviews, and maybe there are, there is an audience for them, right? So if that was your goal, so your core idea is scalable, but how are you going to start? So the unscalable things that you do is actually just get the, the, the start the engine, right? And the unscalable thing you would probably do is doing a bunch of webcam interviews yourself and do a bunch of webcam interviews with people you know, and you maybe you s slowly try to convince like the first few people do, to do it like in addition to you. Maybe you I don't know like. You go to some famous people you know and ask, try to ask them to do the interviews. The real question here is, can you go from this unscalable initial operations to a scalable approach? Exactly, yeah. Like in the example of webcam interviews, it would work because like you have a like big enough followership and 
one of your um, one of the people in your audience may say, you know what, I can also do like web commentaries. Why why don't I do the same thing? So I will actually maybe like join your company, startup, and I'll do my I'll start doing my own web commentaries. And if you reach some of these famous people, they may actually cause like some of their followers to start. So there is like once you do this consistently, and when, when you're able to get retain some of the early users, eventually it starts scaling. It becomes it's it's the you start a snowball working. For example, in Airbnb's case, obviously they knew that they couldn't scale taking photos of every house, but right. they scaled it a little bit. So they built an operation. So they were uh, hiring uh, third-party contractor photographers to go to different locations and take photos. But it does also have a ripple effect. So if you take a city like New York where they had a density, and if you fix the first two pages of the listing, so they have amazing photos, what happens is the people in the third page will think that the way to have more hosts, more sorry, more guests, is to have better photography. And they will actually mimic what the top hosts are doing. And the fact that you did the unscalable things to help them, help making them look better, will actually cause the other people to mimic the same thing, and they will try to get better photography. And good house photography is not mag is not rocket science. You can look at a bunch of good photos, and actually you can figure out how to take better photos of your own house. Or maybe you have a cousin which is better at photography than you. Maybe you invite that person. So usually, all of these stars have some ripple effects. It's actually it has some more kind of, um, kind of more scalable effect. In our case, we created the first few courses ourselves, first few paid courses, in a particular style. And they became successful. And a lot of other instructors actually mimic that style. right? In the early days, we, when we were creating our own courses, we decided to make them super tactical. We didn't want to have a bunch of motivational bullshit. We said, Udemy courses are going to teach you exactly how to do something particular. Right. They won't talk to you about how to become better entrepreneurs than how to follow your passion. There are a lot of free videos on YouTube about this. But instead, our entrepreneurship courses will teach you how to raise money, how to do a pitch deck, how to send an introduction email, how to close your round. Right? And our hypothesis was that that would actually monetize. People would be paying for that. Their tactical advice. So it turned out to be true. And pretty much all the, the YouTube courses following us kind of used a similar approach. So very interesting. Very interesting. I can give like maybe tens of examples about this, but like a lot of things that you set up initially, like you figure out, like in an unscalable way, it actually does become the core of what you do, even when you have thousands of instructors. All right. OK, so I'll kind of give you some, a few more specific tricks about these two concepts. So liquidity and things don't scale. So just a few examples. Um, so these, are, these will be like a bunch of tricks. So the trick number one, so you have this chicken and egg problem. You can actually fake the chicken, right? So when we first launched Udemy, there were zero courses on Udemy. And if you launch it that way, it will be a disappointment for uh, users who come to the website. So instead of that, what we did was we there we found a bunch of uh, Creative Commons open courseware from universities. They were free courses. They were free to use, right? And we talked to them, and we simply crawled all of those courses and put them up as courses on Udemy. So when we first launched, we had 600 courses and 12,000 video lectures. And the first few thousands, tens of thousands of users who came to Udemy, they actually saw value, value at Udemy because like, it was clear that those weren't our courses, but we had actually aggregated and we had put them in a nicer user interface for the students. So we were actually providing still a lot of value with, um, with the curation that we were doing there. So this is actually, like very, very useful. Like Just like fake it until you make it. And another like thing to test is being your own supply. This, is, this comes with the uh, unscalable thing. So, in Udemy, we first tried to ask our investors to create a course on Udemy, but even they said no, because teaching a course on Udemy was a, a lot of work. This is like unlike sharing, selling something on eBay or doing something on, I don't know, Craigslist, like where you just put a p listing page. In Udemy, you have to put maybe a, one month of work or maybe two weeks of work at least to put up a course online. 
And if you don't know whether you are going to see value or not, it's really hard to convince people. So we started creating our own three of our own courses. So, and these are the first three paid courses. And the way we were doing was, like, just convincing people to teach courses was hard. Instead, we organized events about three different subjects. The first event we, were, we organized was called Raising Money for Startups. And what the, the heck we did was, we made a curriculum for raising money. So we broke it into seven pieces. And we asked each um, speaker to talk about a particular topic about raising money. So they all gave their talks, and we videotaped everything. We sold some tickets and used that money to kind of do video production and editing. And we made the course from it. So it was actually a conference. But since it was designed like a course, it worked just like a course. And that course still is one of the most successful courses on Udemy. And you basically uh, uh, organized the event, and you did um, a video recording of all the, the speeches. Yeah, exactly. So this, this, this was a kind of super, I think, genius idea from my co-founder, Gagan. So we turned like some events we were organized into courses. And it was about, so this is different than you go to any conference and we do take them and make it a course. That might not work. So although you do it, like it, it wouldn't work well. But in our case, we already designed them like a course. So the end user experience was already pretty good. So, um, and users knew that it was a con from a conference, but they, they didn't mind. It was exactly doing what they wanted to uh, achieve. So, and there are a lot of examples of this from different companies, but I'll kind of keep to another theme. So, um, getting density across the world can, can be easy. Like, what you could do is you could actually focus on a very particular segment. For example, eBay in the early days was super successful with collectibles. It was almost like a website to sell collectibles. Although their te technically their product was broader, like collectible was like you wouldn't be able, you weren't able to find collectibles anywhere else. So you people went to eBay for collectibles, and when they went there for that, eventually they start selling and buying other stuff as well. It's really like it really helped them get density in a wise uh, focusing in that area. Like Facebook was uh, obviously as everybody, everybody knows it. Like it was in Harvard. Just because they were confined to Harvard, they were, they were able to get like 70, 80 percent of the students um, on the platform very quickly. And Yelp, like again, huge chicken and egg problem. So they really focused on restaurants in San Francisco. They made they had interns going to different restaurants and writing reviews. But eventually, like if you were a person in San Francisco and if you looked. If you look for a restaurant, Yelp was a viable resource from the early days because by focusing on a sub-segment, they were able to, able to get um, get good density. And then eventually, all of these companies go to just expand into other verticals, other areas, other countries. But in the early days, that that focus really like makes you successful. So. Um, and and, where, and and sorry, um, Aaron, and and where Udemy focused in the beginning. Yes, that's a kind of funny subject. So I recommend this to everybody, but we didn't focus early on. So we made just we just made our job significantly harder. So we always thought about focusing and try to look for areas, but but the challenge with focusing is that you have to choose the right place to start with. If you choose the wrong place to start with, it might actually kill your company. So in Udemy's case, we thought that online poker would be the best vertical. Okay. Online and, poker. Yes, online poker. Um, like online poker training. So um, it might sound funny to you, like, but looking at the retrospective. But, but the reason we thought it was interesting was because it, there was a lot of money at online poker. So you could make, like, make a lot of money. And in our early days of Udemy, our biggest concern was would people care about learning, casual learning enough to spend time and money, right? And 90% of the market, all, including most of our investors, thought that people wouldn't be spending money and time for casual learning. Pe most people, the de facto thinking was people only learn things if they have to learn it, right? That means you, they have to take a finishing course because they want to get a diploma or a certification or a promotion in their job. So that was kind of common sense. So that was like we thought otherwise, but we still weren't sure, right? So online poker, the fact that there was real money in it, made it more likely that people would want to learn it. And the de facto learning methodology was online videos. So there were casts of previous games. So you would actually watch those games, and that's how you learn. So we thought that it was a perfect 
um, platform and intent uh, fit. It didn't turn out to be big because it was actually a small, very, very niche market and it wasn't a very good market to operate on. But anyway, so that was kind of what we thought would be the best, biggest market. But very quickly we realized, okay, and that was too hard. Although it theoretically makes made sense, we didn't have strong enough ties to that market. Then we started doing entrepreneurship courses. That was our first target market. Um, the, this, the advantage of entrepreneurship was that we had more access to people who are already in the market, so we were able to convince some people to teach courses. But then the disadvantage is kind of small, right? There are not that many entrepreneurs in the world uh, compared to other areas. Um, and the first real successful market uh, vertical for us was technology market, development market. So our first few courses were development courses which were very successful, and we, they, were, they became our first hits. So our focus became for long time technology, and then we added business and design as kind of other areas of focus. Um, and then, like more recently, we started doing a lot of photography courses, yoga courses. So we still like choose some areas to focus on, but we don't. But the difference is we didn't close the product for other use cases, because I wanted every person to be able to teach on Udemy. I didn't want to like close them, close it to them. We just like when we operationally went after instructors, we kind of uh, used our resources and sort of worked us first. Right. So you basically decided to you you choose some theme, but you leave the platform open. So if someone is coming to do a video course for about table tennis, he yeah. can do it, but uh, is not the let's say the main focus of the main theme of the company. Yeah, and especially when I say focus, it's mostly going after instructors. For example, when we decided that we are going to be good at development, what did what we did was we just we listed every single programming language in the world and every single like framework in the world and tried to make sure we had at least one or two courses about each of these languages. So we had people going after instructors convincing to teach on Udemy those subjects. So we could do this across like 50 different verticals, but that would be successful. Instead, instead we just picked technology development and we made sure we had density in the, that area. So that if so if you wanted to learn programming and if you wanted to if you went to Udemy in the early days, even in the early days, that was a course for you. So we, it helped us create liquidity in the demand side. Got it. And how could you attract uh, um, an audience on different niche? But because, I mean, one thing is attracting uh, a marketing manager to follow, uh, I don't know, Jack Welch talking about business or whatever, or Seth Godin. Um, and on the other side, uh, a, a developer coming for a Python course totally different audience, totally different customer acquisition strategy. So how could you manage to, to get such a different users? That's a very good question. And honestly, the answer of this question is the very reason Udemy is and is pretty successful right now. And it is going to be a like, massive company in the future. The, the, the reason is the answer of this question. So people want to learn different things. If you're a programmer, you don't want to learn programming. You probably, like a lot of programmers want to learn design because they're interested or they want to start a company so they want to learn about entrepreneurship. And at one point they will need to get users for their uh, side projects and they will want to learn about SEO and other marketing tools. And they probably, they might have a, a professional DSLR camera so they, they will want to also take a photography course. So, Users are not completely divided in between different verticals. A lot of users want to learn several different things. And throughout their, t their life, those subjects also change, right? For example, even I look at myself, like I, I took much of development courses, although I, I'm a developer, but there were technologies that I didn't know, so I took courses about them. I took actually a lot more courses on Udemy about design, UX, and product, because I'm interested in learning learn those. I took some like growth marketing courses and some entrepreneurship courses. So I was leaving the country, so I took an accent reduction course to reduce my um, accent. Um, and I, I really like magic tricks, so I took a magic tricks course on Udemy. And these things also keep changing. Like every time in my life, I usually have different challenge, different things that I want to do. They might be hobbies or they might be professional challenges. So, But I always have something to learn. For, learn. So. Because of that, like Udemy has a much larger potential market than a company which only teaches programming. Because the moment you don't want to learn programming, you won't use that product anymore. But we have four-year-old users; they still take new courses because, 
like we have all this cross promotion across different verticals. And the way we operated this was we kind of went to neighbor like um, adjacent verticals first. Um, like we had development first, and actually going to business and entrepreneurship wasn't hard. And then from that design was kind of adjacent, so it was easier for us to go to adjacent markets. But on the other hand, since we didn't close the platform, we had this random random trends in different verticals. One of them that was a pretty famous yoga instructor, Sadie Nardini. She created a course yeah. on Udemy, and she became really successful. And since that day, we have an unusual amount of very good yoga courses, right? Even one person sometimes might be enough to create a, uh, create a density if that person has a good enough followership, right? So when you're marketplace, you always observe this kind of one come person comes, teach something, and their follower starts teaching, and you, all of a sudden you get density in that area. Okay, got it. So basically, also the instructors are the the the, the guys who promote the, their courses and bring the the relevant niche to that topic. Exactly. That actually is the next trick. So when you're a marketplace, your your supply side has a pretty strong drive to get more users, and because if you are teaching on Udemy, like. Obviously, like, you might want to get more students by teaching on Udemy, but especially in the early days, that wasn't why people were creating courses on Udemy. People were creating a course on Udemy because they wanted to teach. Pretty often, they had all they already had some audience, and Udemy made the technology much better. So when you are small as a marketplace, sometimes um, your value is not just finding demand for supply side, but instead it might be making their job easier, right? Because you're some of your supplies that might already have some demand. So in Udemy, like, like a lot of instructors had some followership. Like they were like massive followership, but it, it was enough for, to, uh, for them to become successful. And they brought their own users. And in the early days, that, in the early days, that was majority of the users that we were getting are were the users that instructors were bringing. But at one point, once we had enough users, the the equation changed. So now, majority of the users on Udemy like are coming from our, our own marketing corporations. Um, but still, especially in new areas, in new areas, instructors are really critical. So, for example, we don't have a, a lot of Chinese courses. So, but we still have some Chinese instructors. So, and I look at their students. Most likely, their students are coming from their own efforts. But once we have enough tests there then like people will start coming to Udemy directly for taking Chinese courses as well. Right. And if you look at companies like Kickstarter, for example, for us this was useful, but not that critical. Uh, but for Kickstarter, this was pretty much the, the all the value they had in the early days. Project creators were bringing a lot of people to Kickstarter because they were promoting their Kickstarter projects on um, like on their Facebook, Twitter, social media, friends, wherever they can, because they were able to trying to raise money. So Kickstarter in the early days acted more like a funding platform for them. Uh, but nowadays, obviously, there are a lot of unique users on Kickstarter, so you will actually get a lot of funding from people who directly go to Kickstarter and browse projects. So what you do as a marketplace is actually incentivizing this and making this process much better. For example, one thing we do on Udemy is um, no, normally, when you have a paid course on Udemy, we take 50% of the revenue. Uh, but if you bring your own stu students, we take 0%. We give 100% of the st those students' uh, revenue to the instructor. So that instructor has ab ab uh, like absolutely no reason not to bring their students to Udemy. All right, so this is another like major trick to like make a successful marketplaces. And it comes to the other one, creating success stories. So if you can make a few like shiny examples of people who became successful from your system, that creates a lot of brand recognition and that attracts a lot of supply side. The, the best, by far the best example of this is Kickstarter. They had this few projects which raised like $10 million, $5 million, and it got so much press Everybody else after that who had a similar project wanted to teach their course, uh, so build their project on Kickstarter. And that, like that few case studies makes a massive change about how fast you can get supply side. For us, that was exactly the case. We had some early on, early on we had some 
a few successful instructors, which made a lot of money on Udemy. And after that, that it, it after those people, it became so much easier for us to get new instructors because now everybody was seeing these people who were able to make it, so that they were like they were they wanted to do the same thing. This is true everywhere. If you look at App Store and you see companies like Instagram, which became billion dollar companies from a mobile application, like think about how many more developers were motivated to build like mobile app businesses just because Instagram became so sure. big early on. So um, for us, like one of these examples, I mean, we had 10 of the instructors which made $5 million in the second year. That was actually, like the fact that that happened and we actually publicized this made a huge difference in how fast we were getting instructors. Honestly, since that days, those days, we don't have to go to instructors anymore. Everybody comes to, like, all, pretty much all the experts come to Udemy to t teach their courses. So we don't need people to, like, reach out to them and convince them, convince them anymore. It's just the case studies uh, attract supply side. Sure. Yeah, and Udemy is a recognized brand, and so you don't need to convince an instructor anymore. Exactly, because they see all the other instructors who are successful. And one thing we do is you go to Udemy and we tell how many students, students there are in each course. Most companies don't do this, but the reason we do this is because you go there and you see an um, like Excel course which has 50,000 users and it is a $100 course. It math like about how much money they made. Uh, so you, you think, okay, like I could do this the same thing. There's a, like even though it's a small, or small chance, there's a chance to become a millionaire from Udemy. Uh, so that, that's actually pretty, pretty powerful. So I probably should like I'll, I will also try to share this presentation so you can actually go back and look at each of the tricks. But each of these are common tricks, and it took us years to figure out this. Like the way I we went we found those tricks was we talked to a lot of other companies who were able to start successful marketplaces, and privately I would always question like talk ask them about how they get their early users. Similarly, this is a kind of summary of every, all the tricks that they are, they were doing. And latest, like there are a few more that I didn't make a slide for. I mean, one is providing a utility function. So sometimes your um, marketplace product or network effect product might have a reason for people to use themselves, right? The, the best example of this was Delicious. So you can consider Delicious as a marketplace of bookmarks. Like you kind of people share interesting pages, and as people share these pages, you can go to Delicious homepage. And you can actually see what pages are most likely popular pages. But in reality, Delicious also had a personal YouTube feature. So it was also a way for you to collect your own bookmarks. And this is actually really powerful because then the initial traction problem doesn't hurt you as well as much because people have a reason to use it by themselves. In our case, there were some instructors who had schools or who had a physical classroom maybe, they were using Udemy as a way to host their curriculum so that if their existing students miss their class, they could come to their Udemy course and kind of rewatch them. So, there is, so this, is, this is what I call a utility function. And I think one of the best examples of this is OpenTable. So like OpenTable open table right now is the place where I go and I find the restaurant to make a reserva reservation for. But it also has a utility function for restaurants. For restaurants, it's an easier way to uh, handle their reservations. Similarly, they spend a lot of time and money and in building the infrastructure for restaurants, so they can they can have all this technology to, that makes it, makes their reservation experience much better. But a few other ones. Again, you can sometimes le uh, leverage third-party distribution channels. A lot of companies grew over. SEO, Google, some companies grew over Facebook's application platform. Udemy was actually very interesting. Like we were probably the, the only company which used daily deal sites and newsletters as a distribution channel. So when we came out, it was kind of the rise of the Groupons and Living Socials and all the deal sites. We we used them to get distribution for our early instructors. So when a instructor put up an iOS course on Udemy, we would go to all the distribution channels, deal sites we knew. We asked them to like do daily deals for these courses, and when they said yes, that would create enough traction for our supply sites. So they were happy, right? Deal sites were happy because um, it was kind of new inventory sure. for them, 
And every time somebody take a, take, took a course from the deal sites and so the sector was happy, but we were retaining the users because the course taking was happening on Udemy. So um, we actually used, uh, I think we kind of very intelligently used that the, the, the popularity of the deal sites to solve our initial traction problem. And this usually changes all the time, like in each like five, 10 years, there, is, there are some other distribution channels. Uh, but if you are like smart enough to take advantage of them, it's, it's, a, it's a big, um, it's a big potential distribution channel. For example, if you can figure out how to use Snapchat or Pinterest, um, like or, or Secret to get traction for your products, so it might be a, it might be a big um, discovery for you. And newsletters was a, a paying activity. You you paid newsletters, or it was like a revenue share again? It was a revenue share. So, but we just we, we just made deals with them, and then separately we made. So what we were doing was we were first going to the newsletters and saying we said, if we had a course about the subject, would you run a promotion for that subject? And they said yes. Then we would go to the newsletter and say, you know what, we have all this distribution for you waiting for you. If you create a course, you will probably make at least two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars. In the early days, that was a small amount, but it was good enough to convince instructors. Uh, and usually what happened is, like we would say, okay, you might be able to get a few thousand dollars, and they were making 10, 20 thousand dollars. And that was actually the time where we realized, okay, you know what, like this is not just like making them happy. There is actually a lot more demand to what we are creating here um, than what we even thought there would be. And then the last trick is, as I said, I, can, I, I, think, I think I covered this already. You can create a magical experience by using the fact that you don't have to scale your operations. You can, I think, like another fun example of this is Quora. So Quora is a question, question and answer site. Again, like massive chicken and egg problem. So I remember that uh, when TechCrunch wrote about Quora, Michael Errington had written, Quora is an amazing website to ask questions to Charlie Shiver, which is one of the co-founders. Because whoever asked a question, Charlie would actually write an answer. So they were actually, and he would actually write super insightful, useful answers. Uh, it was almost like a free way to get the, get the mind of a very smart person. Um, so it was good experience for the first few users who, are, who were coming to site until they had enough Community mo community momentum. Okay, so I think I'm kind of this is the, this is the end of the getting initial traction. I mean, you can realize how much time I like put into that part of the talk. Yeah, but we are really long. But it's so interesting that I will stay here six hours. But I, I think we have to to let's say take it in ten minutes more, and then then we have to quit. No, I mean, we are, we are going to quit very soon. So because once you have the critical mass, what's next? Honestly, you just enjoy it. So that's the, that's the bit of my, my, my marketplace. Once you create a marketplace, you are so powerful. You are so like strong. I mean, obviously, you still should improve it and make sure the, your customers are still happy with your product and happy with your marketplace. But really, it's all like downhill. And at one point, it's kind of it's not that, that hard. It's just like getting through the initial hump is by far the biggest problem. So, um, OK, I have some additional articles I will share. So that's pretty much it for my talk. So I assume if you have time, you can take some questions from the yeah, crowd. Let me, let me ask you a couple of things. Um, first one is, is about also the business model of, from Udemy. I, uh, I saw, for instance, Skillshare or um, I don't know, di different kind of thing. General Assembly, which is not a marketplace. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. just to give a, a few names, they are going for a, a, a monthly subscription. So you subscribe yeah. and you get access to all the videos, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Udemy is going for uh, a course. So you have to sell a course. Uh, th there is no subscription, at least that, that I know. Yeah. So wh why this decision and uh, the, wh what's the reason behind yeah, so this decision was pretty easy or not. We made this argument several times. So we probably do the argument every six months in, in the company. In the early days, we weren't a subscription business because we didn't have enough supply to make it worth somebody's worth a monthly subscription. Right, so that was very clear. Um, 
And as you grow, now like Udemy has enough content to like make a subscription business like worthwhile for the customer. So, by the way, like all of these companies you counted, although technically Skillshare is a marketplace like Udemy, in reality they produce most of the courses themselves, themselves with their supply side. So it's technically it's practically more like a publisher, just like any other publishing companies. And in, my, in Udemy, like most of our competition are publishers, companies like Linda, Journal Assembly, whatever. So right. um, they they produce content and they sell it, right? And usually publishers go with subscription model because it's kind of easier customer relationship. Uh, for us, like there are some ups, uh, pros and cons of being a subscription model. The biggest issue is it's really hard to make a subscription work as a marketplace because we will collect money from stu students and how they distribute, it, distribute that money to your yeah. um, supply side, to your supply side, right? Like it's based on enrollments, engagements. So it's kind of hard. So just kind of, by the way, like most people don't realize this, but we have a subscription model. Uh, the difference is it's only for companies. So okay. we, uh, the subscription model is not accessible to the consumers yet. It's like only for companies. And the reason we did it for companies is was for if to sell courses to companies, you had to have subscription. Companies don't make buying decisions like anecdotally. They make budgets. So the subscriptions was pretty much the only way you can sell to companies, right? Because they want to exactly know how much they are going to spend next year for that, that uh, item, for that learning item, right? So we do it, but it's kind of harder. There are a few companies who was able to do subscription in a um, in a marketplace model. Honestly, it's really two companies, Audible is the audiobook company yep. that Amazon bought. They do subscription model. Uh, I think they pay their supplies at $1 per download. And there is Shutterstock. Shutterstock is the stock image subscription, subscription uh, where the assets are created by, this, um, uploaded by the supply side, uh, by the community. So these are the two models where it works usually like, it's, I mean, it might work for Udemy too. Like honestly, like we might test it at one point. It's kind of hard because Udemy courses have different time lengths, different difficulty levels, and how you when you once you collected the money, how you want to distribute to yeah. among yeah. your students is kind of hard. Also, there's one more problem. A lot, of, a lot of Udemy students like the fact that they have lifetime access to courses. So some, like a lot of our power users, don't actually want to be paying per month, they want the fact that they can pay once and like forever they can access that course. Got it. Versus if it's a subscription, the moment they stop paying, they won't be able to access their course anymore. So honestly, there are advantages, advantages and disadvantages in both models. So we may end up doing both eventually. OK. Uh, last couple of questions, and then I, I, I'll let you go. Uh, what's the mobile uh, weight uh, compared with, uh, with the desktop? Uh, um, usage. Yes. I mean, the, do you see a huge, just a huge trend in mobile? Because in the end, I mean, I think about my courses are yeah. videos. The, the, by the way, I did now a, a new course, still waiting for Udemy to accept it because now your revision process is so hard that it's uh, uh, almost impossible to pass it, but I hope I'll, I'll make it. And, uh, you know, I have, I don't know, 42 videos. So, are 42 videos. And um, so, I think when you have to ch watch it from mobile, it, I don't know, it's pretty hard. So I, I was wondering how it works uh, for you, yeah. the, the, all the mobile stuff. So we launched our first iOS and iOS applications, I think, two years ago. But roughly one and a half years ago, like the, the battery versions came out. And the Android application is, I think, eight months old right now. So. And we already see more than 40% of engagement on mobile. So okay. and it's growing, yeah, 40% on mobile. So in terms of the total enrollments, like paying for courses, it's less. Most people buy it from their desktops. But when it comes to the engagement consumption, it's actually quickly moving to mobile. And then I'm guessing that uh, around 70% of the engagement is going to happen on mobile in two years. OK. Wow, um, amazing. So there, so there are some like the kind of details though. So 
a lot of like the course on Udemy are technological courses. You learn development or design or Excel things like that. In that case, actually, mobile doesn't work well because you are you already have to do the actual work on your computer. So you have to be in front of your computer because you are going to use Excel, right? So, so those people like kind of have to use the web application. But there is a new trend that we are seeing right now. People are also, are also using mobile devices as a third and second screen. So they put their, they take their iPad, put it up on the side, open the Udemy application, watch the video, and they use their computer to do the practices okay. or take some discussions. So we also like, in addition to seeing heavy use of mobile, like we are also seeing a, a lot of like a dual use case where they use the web and the mobile in the same time. Um, Interesting. That's very interesting. All right. Uh, I, will, I would like to, the, the final question is mine, and I would like to know when you'll give me access to the email of my subscribers, but I know that it will never happen, so I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm used now to it. But yeah. uh, I, I always wonder why. Why you, you don't give access to email of uh, subscribers to instructors? I mean, there's a very, 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 like, there's a very basic reason. So in the world of online courses, uh, we are demand constrained, meaning that you have a course on Udemy. If you have 10 times more users who are who are willing to take your course, it wouldn't matter for you. You like, we wouldn't be constrained by the supply side so because once you create a course, almost unlimited people take take that course, right? So our pro and when we talk to our instructors, by far their biggest ask from you, Udemy is getting more users. Like everybody wants more users. That's their priority. Right. So, so when we make like, so and there are times where the benefit of your con demand and the benefit of your supply conflicts. Usually they, they align, but there are these moments where it conflicts. And when we talk to users, our users don't want to, um, don't want us to give their email addresses for the to the instructors of the courses that they are enrolled in. So we understand why the instructors want this, we have empathy, but users don't want to give that, give that email address. Right. And, and the same reason, they also don't want to go to 10 different websites to take 10 courses. I mean, you are, are do you like buy stuff from Amazon? Yeah, sure, sure, because yeah. you know, it's just exactly. it's there and right. super right. great yeah. experience. So like you like Amazon, right? Because although like what you're buying is coming from different companies, Amazon, like you don't want to buy 10 different, 20 different things in three different companies, you actually like the fact that you can go to Amazon and buy, and buy everything because you already trust the brand, you already trust the customer support and everything. So like people want to, like users want a single destination and users also don't want to like give their, they Got don't it. want their emails to be passed to instructors. So for us, if we were doing it, we would actually have a significant pushback from our users. And we actually surveyed this. Like we, a few times, we asked how the users would feel about this. We like to small, we chose like small sample size and asked them, and it was extremely negative. Like users don't like hate the idea of even that happening. Sure, sure. Um, so, like although if we do this, if it sucks, it might be slightly happier. The fact that we will lose so many users will actually hurt them much more. Got that's, it. That's exactly why we are All not right. doing it. All right. Aaron, so it was really, really interesting. I, I've been writing a lot of notes, and uh, I'm sure people watching this video, they, they, they just got a lot of interesting insights about marketplace and uh, mobile-related topic and, and so on. And what can I say? What, what's next for Udemy? I mean, IPO or what, whatever. What, what, what's happening next? I mean, there might be like financial outcomes like IPO or do being really large, but honestly, I'm like less enthusiastic about those. So to me, it's more about like like what's next for us to solve. So we have a lot of English courses, but not the the, the whole world doesn't speak English. Um, they may not speak English, or they might want to learn from their own languages. So actually, like international expansion is really big for us. I want this to go to the whole world. So um, if you're in Nigeria. Like what you want to learn might also not be might, is probably very different from what people in America want to learn, right? So, Absolutely. and the way you would want to learn is probably different. So we want people in Nigeria teaching people in Nigeria. We want people in like Korea teaching people in Korea as well. So that's really critical. And the other thing I'm really looking into is can we how can we innovate on the experience of online learning? Right now, most of the courses are based on video and like a nice community, you know, set of community tools. 
that was that has been a pretty big innovation already. But there's still like more we could do there, especially around like the learning theories. These days I'm really big on like I'm reading a lot of books around learning. So sure. can we can we make people like do practices, projects, reflect what they learned? Uh, and can we build some of those activities inside the platform so we can kind of improve the retention of what you just learned? Essentially, like just improving the learning experience is my next. Like that's the thing that I'm focusing on these days. Fantastic. Very interesting to see what what will, will be next. And uh, Aaron, thank you so much, Aaron Bali, co-founder of Udemy. Good luck for everything, and thanks for your time. Really. All right. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot. This, this was a really fun conversation. And I'll, I'll ask the team to give pride to your uh, thing. I'm looking for your next course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and guys, uh, SME's Mobile Strategies will be back tomorrow, another big day, a full session during the day. So check it out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.